subscribe to our YouTube channel and press the bell icon to get the latest updates. Some of you may be wondering what business does an economist have in delivering a Palkiwala memorial lecture. There are possibly two justifications. One is, as Major General Kumar just told you, this is the last lecture in the series, and probably they ran out of eminent jurists and judges. <laughs> the other possible justification is that like some of us, the younger lot, we grew up listening to the budget talks delivered by Mr. Palkiwala. As Bowman mentioned, some time ago, before I joined the government, obviously, I was invited to deliver a budget talk in Bombay. There were about 500 people. I have no idea whether the talk went off well or not. But the organizers told me, look, you could only get 500 people. With Palkiwala, it used to be 10,000, and there was a dispute about whether it was 10,000 inside and 100,000 outside. So having been asked to deliver this talk, which, by the way, could have been far better delivered either by Mr. Bora or Mohan Kumar. I chose a sufficiently, sufficiently intriguing title of the law of the state and the state of the law. Because I thought, all right, state of the law, everyone would be able to figure out what I'm going to talk about. But the law of the state will no doubt puzzle everyone that oh, what on earth does it mean? I will tell you later what I intend it to be, but first I want to begin with the state of the law. And I will begin with certain very, very obvious things that all of us are familiar with, except they don't always register. The first obvious fact is that the role of governments everywhere in the world is to deliver security, law and justice. In terms of the priorities, and all of us expect all kinds of different things on the part of the government, in terms of the priorities, the most important thing that governments are required to deliver is law and justice and security. But look at the number of times we get agitated about what the government is doing on health, what it is doing on education, and contrast this with the kind of tolerance we have with what is happening on justice. And I will come back to this refrain later on, because in any case it is about we the people, and particularly with Mr. Palkiwala, it is about we the people. What are the numbers? Depending on whether you include quasi-judicial forums or not, Mr. Bora will know. Mohan will correct me and say you should say four hours, but I shall say four hours. <coughs> Depending on whether you count quasi judicial forums or not, we have 35 million cases pending almost. Very simple back of the envelope calculation, and you will always say, you will obviously say it's a back of the envelope calculation. Typically, a dispute has two sides, two litigants. Of course, on the criminal side, the government is a litigant, but on the civil side, sometimes you have multiple litigants. So just purely back of the envelope, assume two litigants. 
So 35 million into 2, that's 70 million. So roughly one third of India's households is involved in one su some suit or the other. One third of India is litigating. One third of India is litigating unsatisfactorily, but the fact that one third of India is litigating also indicates that in all of this cynicism that one has about the other organs of state as laid down in the constitution, households are still convinced that the justice system will deliver even though we also watch Damini and we are also familiar with the phenomenon of Tari Petari. <laughs> In the early 90s, the World Bank did again a very back of the envelope kind of stuff. And it asked the following question. Remember, the 90s reforms had just been introduced, economic reforms had just been introduced to the very, very back of the envelope kind of calculation that if we fix the legal system in its entirety, what increment to GDP growth would that bring about? <coughs> we fix the legal system in all in its entirety what contribution incrementally do we get to GDP? And the answer was 1%. Whether it's 1% or more than 1% is beside the point. What is the point is when we talk about markets, when as economists we talk about markets, the role of markets, the role of the state, all of this takes place in a certain context. The market is not a subsimanti where I go and transact. The market is a conceptual notion which is grounded in a substructure which includes the legal system. And if that legal system is not satisfactory, one is not going to get efficiency elsewhere. More recently, there are the doing business indicators that media tracks, that the government tracks. In the doing business indicators, there are various kinds of variables the World Bank uses. And I'm not talking about something as obvious as enforcing a contract, but there is a measure of the legal infrastructure. And in that measure of the legal infrastructure, as expected, India does not do all that well. Obviously, if the dispute resolution system does not lead to swift resolution of disputes, then it's not credible. That much is obvious. The issue is not <coughs> The issue is the earliest point in time in terms of a commission that I have ever been able to track down was a report by, sorry, Justice Rankin I was about to say, 1924-1925. If you read that Justice Rankin Committee report, it was set up in 1924, it submitted its report in 1925. And if you look at that language, if you read that language, you would not change a single word. And many of the solutions that Justice Rankin <laughs> talked about, many of the solutions which have been echoed and endorsed in a succession of law commission reports, are a reiteration of what Justice Rankin said. <coughs> Broadly speaking, I am an economist, I can't ignore it, although I'm ostensibly ignoring it for purposes of this talk. Essentially, it boils down to supply, demand, or productivity. There's 
solutions. <coughs> Today the system is such that the cost of justice, the price of justice is too high and genuine litigants are crowded out of the system. Of course there is a quasi-judicial fora like we see in Bollywood films or used to see in Bollywood films in the 1970s or a system where dispute resolution is handed over to the mafia but by that <coughs> genuine litigants are crowded up. So therefore what one needs to do is to reduce the cost of justice delivery and which means that either you must have reform that address the supply side or you must have reform that address the demand side or you must do something that is in the nature of productivity. As I said, the issue is not new. In the Bible, I think it was in Exodus. Yes, it was in Exodus. Joshua goes to Moses and says, there are too many disputes. People are coming to me with all manner of disputes. I can't handle it. And Moses said what is very obvious. Have more judges. Have more courts. He didn't exactly use the word. He said have more benches. And the traditional approach iterated time and again in law commission reports is let's have more judges. Let's have more benches. Let's have more courts. A supply side response, and that will solve the problem. It hasn't quite A long time back, there was an economist known as Say, who formulated a law known as Say's Law. Say's Law simply said, supply creates its own demand. And exactly similarly, you had all of these courts, they haven't really worked. There are all kinds of things. There have been the fast track courts, local dollars, people's courts, women's courts, grand nihilists, tribunals. All of these is something, I think Mark Gallante used this expression of bypassing the system and he was normative about it. That's not very desirable. You should fix the entire system. But if we cannot fix the system, then at least let's try and address some areas. <coughs> what is the long and the short answer of all of these experiments? The long and the short answer is they have worked in some places, they have worked in some states, but is it actually the case that they have worked across the board? The answer is no. And why not? All of these were meant to evolve their own procedures. <coughs> Part of the problem is that they have not evolved their own procedures, they have followed the standard court I mentioned these large number of disputes, roughly speaking at the aggregate level, about two thirds of them are criminal disputes, about one third is civil disputes. Those of you who are lawyers or dabble in the law or are judges or dabbled in the law will be aware that with a great deal of fanfare an amendment to the Civil Procedure Code was brought out in 2001 and 2002. When this amendment to the Civil Procedure Code was brought about, it was stated as a stated intention that with this new amended CPC, the average civil dispute will be resolved within one and a half years. What has been the result? The result has been, and one must be careful because after all, there is something called the Contempt of Courts Act, which invokes the clauses 
if you say anything that scandalizes the court. So with all due respect to the courts, the amendments to the CPC have essentially been overturned. Meaning they have not achieved the desired object. And now there is talk of amending the CRPC and the Indian Penal Code, which are on the criminal side. Earlier there was a Malimath Committee report, everyone forgot about it. There was a Madhav Menon Committee report, everyone has forgotten about it. And we are now thinking of redoing the CRPC for the IPC, which of course should be redone. Because the IPC was originally the first draft of the IPC or what came to be known as the IPC was almost single-handedly the work of a man who is much maligned, unnecessarily in my view, and that's Macaulay. But Macaulay was extremely, extremely precise. And if you compare Macaulay's original draft with, of 1835 with the Indian Penal Code as it was finally enacted, you will find that wherever offences and penalties were awarded that were not drafted by Macaulay, we subsequently had problems. There is a section, I think 125 of IPC, which says, that if we wage war against an Asiatic power, you are guilty of committing an IPC. I am not aware of any cases under section 125 of IPC. If there are lawyers here who know better, please correct me. But I have still not been able to figure out what an Asiatic power is. Macaulay wouldn't have done it, but leave that aside. So if I go back to the supply side, apart from the procedures, the CRPC and the IPC, one perpetually hears about vacancies. Now, All India Judicial Service, but if you are not talking about the Supreme Court, but if you are talking about the aggregate, the vacancies does not compare very unfavorably. Vacancies, when I'm using the word vacancies, I mean when there are posts, but you're not filling them up in time. If you compare that, not Supreme Court, all the way down to a judiciary, the vacancy figure does not compare very unfavorably with vacancy figures elsewhere in government, police included. But if you could fill the vacancies, <laughs> That would amount to roughly a 25% increase in the number of judges. Rough. I should also quickly flag the issue of appeals. I have never understood why we should have two appeals. Whenever I mention it to my friends in the legal fraternity and sorority, they say it's against the principles of natural justice. So whenever I have to wake up in the morning, I set an alarm. And just to make sure, I set another alarm 10 minutes later. But I invariably wake up with the first alarm. I have logically not understood what is so very great about the second appeal. I have been told that I have read that a second appeal must be on grounds of law, not on grounds of facts. But I constantly see situations where a second appeal is happening clearly on grounds of facts and it is not facts that have been subsequently discovered. <coughs> so I think we broadly need to ask ourselves as a collective entity, whether we need to curb appeals, whether we need to particularly curb appeals at the level of the Supreme Court, where in other jurisdictions in the world, the Supreme Court certainly does not entertain this number of petitions. 
Nowhere in the world that I am aware of, at the level of the Supreme Court or the highest court of the land, is more than about 10% admitted. So I do want to flag the question of appeals, and I also want to flag pointless appeals on the part of the government, which I will come back to later on. I also want to flag the issue of management of courts. What are judges good at? They are good at delivering judgments. What are teachers good at? What is Mohan Rao good at? He is good at lecturing. So he lectures in O.P. Chintam. But does O.P. Chintam have a registrar? Or does it have an academic to run that administrative function? I don't know actually. But many educational institutions have now recognized that an administrative function is not necessarily best delivered by a faculty member. Now if that is accepted, I do not understand why the management of courts cannot be handed over to professions. Not the actual judgment. But you mentioned this and there is an enormous amount of resistance. In every place that I know of, in every organization that any individual works in, there are performance indicators. But you mentioned performance indicators for the judiciary and you get abused. Now don't misunderstand. I am not suggesting that someone from outside should come along and frame those performance indicators. All that I am asking is why cannot the judiciary itself evolve its own performance indicators and accountability indicators? Why is it the case that we must have an institution where there is no accountability and where there are no performance indicators? This is particularly important and I am making a very loaded statement. This is particularly important because I think that in the last several decades the judiciary has been captured by the bar. For instance, when the PILs were first started, they were supposed to bring about all kinds of desirable benefits as they have. But if you look at the analysis that has been done of the kinds of lawyers who are successful in getting the PILs admitted, you will find that it is a small incestuous amount. Which is particularly one of the reasons why I am harping on the management of courts the listing of cases being handled by a profession. The lawyers are particularly important because if it's a civil case, I told you earlier that two thirds of criminal cases are criminal cases, particularly concentrated in lower courts, and one third are civil cases. It is my conviction now that for a typical civil case, the moment the issues are framed, you know what the outcome is going to be. Not with certainty, but within that range. The moment the issues are framed, you know what the outcome will be within that range. Thereafter, one side or the other as a litigant is interested in protecting the status quo. And therefore, we continuously have a job loss. Many years ago, I guess, well, the main reason I am probably here is because once upon a time I was involved with the law reforms project. <clears throat> and when I was involved with the law reforms project, I was introduced to various lawyers. 
And I met a lawyer, I was introduced to a lawyer, and I was told. So I asked, what is he good at? Okay, I met Shardul, and you said Shardul was good at this, this, Praveen Anand, IPR. What is this particular gentleman good at? I was told he is good at delaying tactics. <laughs> and yes, I learned that his, that his reputation was built on figuring out ways of dealing. <coughs> Let me now quickly mention criminal cases. And criminal cases brings us to the area of police reforms, which as citizens we don't seem to be bothered about. Since the Prakash Singh judgment in 1996, police reforms have been on the agenda. The fact of the matter is that very few states have done anything substantial to introduce police reforms, which is not only about the All India Services, it is also about the constables who account for the bulk of the police force and of all the ASIs. Recently, Crime in India was published, the National Crime Records Bureau document. And it tells you what we always know, everyone has known this year also, we learn the same thing, that the conviction rate is very, very low. Conviction rate defined as what? Conviction rate from the time of filing the FIR or conviction rate from the time of filing the charge sheet. If it is conviction rate from the time of filing the charge sheet, you will find that the conviction rate is pretty high. It's about almost 20%. But the moment it is conviction rate calculated from the time of filing the FIR, it's about 6%. So the problem is from FIR to the charge sheet. Is examining that on anyone's agenda? No. A completely, completely heretical proposition. I sometimes wonder whether we were better off in the pre-Nanavati days with a jury system for criminal trials. For no other reason but for the fact that if we have a bunch of jurors together, you will be forced to have day-to-day -day hearings and you will not have indefinite enjoyments. And I cannot really understand why we cannot have day-to-day -day hearings in a large number of cases instead of the present system where cases drag on, judges get transferred, so everything starts fresh. I mentioned <coughs> government appeals earlier. The government <coughs> accounts for a large number of appeals and cases on the civil side. Criminal side is obvious. A long time ago, there was a, there was a study done for Karnataka High Court, which found for Karnataka High Court that the government was a litigant in 60% of the civil cases sometimes on both sides, because it was one government entity fighting another government entity. About 90% of these were government appeals, and most of these government appeals failed. I want to quickly mention two things that some of you may not be familiar with. One is an initiative by the Union Ministry of Law or Department of Justice called LIMPS. LIMS tracks all union government cases. And LIMS has been phenomenally successful in the few number of years it's been in existence in reducing government appeals, pointless appeals, particularly on civil matters. And something like LIMS, I think, should be replicated elsewhere, state governments. I also want to quickly mention Phenomenal research that's been done by two organizations, and I recommend you read them if you are not familiar with these two organizations. One is Vidhi, and the other one is Daksh. Phenomenal, phenomenal work on the legal system. 
I've said enough on the state of the law. So let me now quickly turn to law of the state. Now what is this vague expression? There is a quote that is attributed to Tacitus, which says something like the following, the more the number of laws, the more the corruption. But Tacitus did not exactly suggest it in the nature of a causation, which is how it's normally suggested in English, but there was some correlation. I used to work in an organization known as Niti Aayog. And now I am full-time with the Economic Advisory Council to the Prime Minister. The predecessor of Niti Aayog was something called Planning Commission. And the Planning Commission tried to determine everything for the country. And therefore I used the expression Planning Commission Mindset. There is a great planning commission mindset in the minds of legislators. Because the tendency is that whatever be the problem, let me pass a piece of legislation as if that will solve the problem. Quite apart from the enforcement costs, if the legislation is unwarranted, it unnecessarily causes problems. Once upon a time, when a bill was drafted, a bill used to have a very clear statement known as the statement of objects and reasons. The statement of objects and reasons clearly set out, why do I want this statute? What happens if I don't have that statute? Well, actually, it didn't answer the second. But at least it said, why do I want the statute? What I think we now need to do systematically is to curb this tendency to excessively legislate. Often the expression judicial impact assessment is used, regulatory impact assessment is used, but I'm talking about two different things together. The first one, is when we pass a statute. Why do we need that statute? What are the benefits? What are the costs? If we don't have that statute, and exactly similarly, and much more dangerously, an impact assessment of every judgment passed. Because it's not just a statute that has a cost, it is a succession of judgments that have also had significant costs. The law of the state also means not just statute, it means administration, administrative law. And many cases have come about because of unnecessary discretion associated with that. When the discretion comes down, those kinds of cases disappear. I do not know amongst the young who are here, how many of you know that the Supreme Court, the highest court of the land, had at one point adjudicated whether green coconut was a vegetable. And it led to a split decision in the Supreme Court. Why was this important? Because vegetables did not pay excise in exactly that same way. The Supreme Court, the highest court of the land, has over a period of time adjudicated whether haldi is a vegetable whether a lemon is a vegetable, etc., etc. So if you curb this discretion, if you simplify, you will cut down on a large number of cases. This is the demand side. Reduce the cases. Also on this is, I mentioned the IPC, but there are a large number of crimes known under the rubric of special and local laws. Many of these, I don't think they deserve to be crimes now. One obvious example of that is instances under the narcotics, drugs, and psychotropic substances. That, things like excise, many of these things. In the introduction, don't be impatient, I'm here in the end. In the introduction, it was, meant, it was mentioned that I've done some translations of text from Sanskrit. <coughs> One of them is the Mahavari. 
So in the Mahabharata, there is this section where Bhishma is lying down on his bed of arrows and is instructing Yudhishthir in Shanti Parva and Anushanti. And Bhishma says, and this is something that's also there in Manusriti, here are the 17 most important type of civil cases which you should try or get tried in order of priority. Thousands of years ago, guess which was the most important item in that list of 17? Breach of contract. Also, Bhishma lying down on his bed of arrows, he tells Yudhishthir that it's a relatively rich person who is guilty of a crime. You should not imprison that person. Because it will be at the cost of the public exchequer. <laughs> if it's a relatively rich person, you should impose a monetary penalty. It's also only the relatively poor who should be put in prison. You might disagree with this on normative grounds, on value judgment grounds, but this has an impeccable logic of its own. And if I had not told you this was Bhishma and the Mahabharata, you would have thought it was the the law and economics people in Chicago would talk about <laughs> Essentially, I think we now need to think two final points. Despite what I said about fast track courts, I think we need some degree of focus. We need some degree of focus. For example, if we could agree on where geographically the second bench should be in UP would have solved the Allahabad High Court problem. If he can solve the acts under the Negotiable Instruments Act and the Motor Vehicles Act, we will solve a large number of problems. If he can solve the problem of old cases, which fast track courts are supposed to solve, and the recent crime in India shows that fast track cases, which are supposed to resolve cases that are old in Bihar, more than half of them <coughs> took more than five years. That's hardly fast track. The second thing I want to mention is about the constitution. I think it's time, particularly with Balkiwa, we need to take a re-look at the entire constitution. That sounds like sacrilege basic structure and all of that. I have questions about the basic structure judgment. But let that be. The final point is, it's about citizens. It's about citizens and citizens exercising the countervailing pressure. To solve the judicial system, we need more money. And look at the kind of demands that one constantly encounters. 4% for health, 6% for education and public expenditure, 10% for infrastructure. Do you hear anyone saying anything about the judiciary? Not really. I think the countervailing pressure is necessary and that countervailing pressure typically leads to reforms on the part of government as well as on the part of the judiciary because the countervailing pressure does not exist. The internal compulsions of the judiciary to reform are non-existent and therefore when the judiciary wants more money, you will never get it. And the last statement, whether it's on judgments, whether it is on statutes, can we have a little bit less of Latin and a little bit more of plain English? Can we have a little bit more of judgments? We'll talk about the facts. Can we have a little bit more of Lord Benning kind of judgments? Can we have fewer judgments which have to quote Iqbal and Shakespeare and whoever it is? And can we have a situation where the Supreme Court does not have to send down a judgment from a high court saying that we are unable to understand what this gentleman is saying. <laughs> I've given you a flavor and very bulleted structure of what I believe to be the most important issues, both in the state of the law and the law of the state. But first, 
law of the state, then the state of the law. Thank you very much.